Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Fuck That. Two quick announcements before I jump into this week's episode. The first is I am going to be doing an audio and video podcast from now on. So if you're interested in the video version of the podcast, you can check me out on YouTube. The handle is FThatPod. The second, I have some exciting news. For those of you that listened to my episode that came out about a month ago, the disappearance of Danielle Bell, I had her sister Bonnie on to discuss Danielle's disappearance. Bonnie and I are in the process of starting a nonprofit, which should hopefully be off of the ground by the fall. And the aim of our nonprofit is to provide resources, information, and linkages to care to people that have either experienced some form of crime or relatives of victims of crime. It is called the Advocacy Lab. So stay tuned. We'll have more information on that as we get closer to the fall. Ah, the 1970s, a time of disco, bell bottoms, and unfortunately rampant homophobia. California was basically a playground for serial killers during this decade. You had the Zodiac Killer, the Hillside Stranglers, and of course, the Doodler. The Doodler in particular claimed the lives of anywhere between 6 to 16 victims, all part of San Francisco's vibrant gay scene. And let's be real, unfortunately, there were probably way more, so 6 is definitely on the lower end of that scale. There are some sources, I read a couple of books, as well as listened to a podcast and read the accompanying articles that came along with it from a reporter from San Francisco who did a really excellent job, but a lot of these sources vary. So some sources say it's as high as 14, others say as high as 16. During this time, the first Pride Parade had just taken place in New York on June 28th of 1970, with San Francisco following shortly after. But regardless of all of these strides, the United States was still very much not progressive. In fact, the American Psychiatric Association still listed homosexuality as a mental disorder in the second edition of the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, until 1973 when the third edition was released. Though it did state in the third edition that if somebody didn't feel heterosexual desire, it could be indicative of mental disorder. Yes, being gay was literally considered a sickness, which is insane to me. Now, San Francisco at that time was up and coming in the LGBTQ community, and today we know that it's known for its liberal and open-minded attitudes, making it a refuge for those that are marginalized by mainstream society. This environment fostered the development of a very vibrant LGBTQ community, particularly within the Castro district. Originally a working class neighborhood, the Castro transformed in the 1960s and the 1970s as gay men began to move in, attracted by the affordable housing and the sense of welcoming community. By the 1970s, the Castro had become one of the first gay neighborhoods in the United States. It wasn't just a place to live, but a cultural and political hub for the LGBTQ community. Bars, clubs, and other businesses catering to gay clientele flourished, and that created a really lively social scene. However, this visibility unfortunately also made the community a target for discrimination and violence particularly with police. The neighborhood's transformation was part of a broader migration of LGBTQ individuals to San Francisco that were looking for acceptance and community, and the influx was instrumental in the rise of LGBTQ activism, which was exemplified by the election of Harvey Milk, and he was the first openly gay elected official in California who became a symbol of hope and resistance. The relationship between the LGBTQ community and the San Francisco Police Department was, let's just say, strained. That would be an understatement. Homophobia wasn't just a social issue, it infiltrated law enforcement and it hindered investigations and kept the killer's identity in this case shrouded in mystery. Now, the first known victim was Gerald Cavanaugh. 
And on the night of January 27th of 1974, a call came in just before 1.30 in the morning. And the call alerted the police to a possible dead person on the beach across from Uloa Street. The caller, who didn't give his name, seemed eager to get off the phone after delivering the information. Now, I'm going to read the 911 transcript so you can get a vibe of how awkward the conversation was between the anonymous caller and dispatch. The operator answered, communications, this is Quintana, may I help you? The caller said, yes, I believe there might be a dead person on the beach at a right across from Aloha Street, Aloha Street, uh, if you follow the street right down to the water. I was walking along there, and I thought I saw somebody lying there, but I don't want to get too close to him because you never know what could happen, okay? The operator said, uh, okay, did you want to give us your name, sir? Caller, no, I don't think it's necessary. I just wanted to let somebody know maybe he needs help or something, but uh, I felt like it was my duty to report it. Operator, okay, fine, we'll check it out. Caller, okay. Operator, uh-huh, bye-bye. Sincerely the most awkward phone interaction ever. Now, when police arrived shortly after 2 a.m., they found Gerald's body along the edge of the water. Sea's Edge at Ocean Beach is known to be dangerous as the waves there very quickly draw people into the water. Unfortunately, a lot of people have gone in for a swim in this area and have not returned. Police brought Gerald's body onto the sand to get a better look. Gerald had been stabbed either 16 or 17 times, sources vary between the two, but one of those wounds included a defensive wound on his left pinky finger. Sometime during Gerald's walk with his killer, he was surprised with this vicious knife attack to the right side of his head. The coroner concluded that due to the number of stab wounds, this demonstrated extreme violence and anger behind the attack. Gerald's blood alcohol content was very low, which indicated that he likely only had maybe one to two drinks that evening. Gerald was not identified immediately. That wouldn't come until a few days later. And the full picture of who Gerald was would be created thanks to Kevin Fagan of the San Francisco Chronicle. This is the journalist investigator that I mentioned earlier in the episode that has a podcast as well as articles that he released. And he was able to determine that Gerald was a furniture finisher born in Montreal, Canada in 1923. And according to Kevin, Gerald left his home when he was young, ending up in San Francisco in the 1970s, likely because of the community and the welcoming vibe that the San Francisco area had. Each year, he would return home to visit his mother, but unfortunately, she passed away in 1967, and after that, he had never visited again. Gerald's family did not know he was gay, and sadly, this was not uncommon for people to remain closeted at the time due to the very heavy anti-LGBTQ sentiment at the time. Gerald's sister and nephew came to identify his body, but nobody came to retrieve his body. Gerald was buried at Holy Cross Catholic Cemetery in Colma, which is a small town on the San Francisco Peninsula in the Bay Area. The specifics of where Gerald met his killer remain unclear to this day, though it is believed that they likely met at one of the city's many gay bars. Accounts recall the killer as an attractive young man with an ability to draw, and this is likely how he brought his victims in. He would pick a bar in the Castro, and somebody would unfortunately catch his eye. The doodler would then draw this person and likely approach them with this drawing as a means to flatter them, and after that, he would lure them to a secluded area. Because he would sketch his victims before he took their lives, that's how he was given the moniker, the doodler. But this didn't happen until after his fourth victim. And I just, I feel like this moniker is not great. Other killers, I, I actually don't like monikers at all. This is just my opinion, but other serial killers during this time were given monikers that make people scared. Not that I think that the media should be instilling fear, but it's kind of interesting when you hear a moniker like the doodler and it's completely on the other end of the spectrum. And it kind of makes me wonder if maybe the very benign nickname was given 
because it's a reflection of the biases that were against the LGBTQ community at the time. The San Francisco Chronicle covered Gerald's murder, but they didn't specifically refer to him as gay. That didn't get addressed until the San Francisco Police Department, their homicide department, released a bulletin that mentioned his homosexual propensities. And that likely hindered any further coverage in the mainstream press because why talk about a vicious murder when you can fan the flames of rampant homophobia? Circling back to the 911 call, again, it was an anonymous tip, but it came specifically from a payphone at the restrooms near Aloha Street at Ocean Beach. The caller was never identified. And this is a particularly notable location because Gerald had previously been stopped by police at those exact restrooms for allegedly having sex there. And then his body was found at Ocean Beach which to me feels like a series of very strange coincidences. The individual who made the call sounded young, but the fact that he ended the call after he said what he had to say was odd. It is likely that maybe it was just a scared person who came across a vicious crime scene and maybe ended up being a shocked witness, but maybe... Maybe it was the person who had thrust San Francisco police into yet another serial killing case at the time. When the first Doodler murder happened, this was a crazy time in the area. The zebra murders were in full swing and the Zodiac Killer was really busy harassing the Chronicle every other day. Then the Doodler emerged and he took full advantage of the fact that police were stretched way too thin as well as the dynamic between police and the LGBTQ community. The relationship between San Francisco police and the LGBTQ community in the 1970s was fraught with tension and mistrust. The police frequently raided gay bars and arrested patrons for minor or even fabricated offenses, often publicly humiliating them as if being charged with something that didn't really happen wasn't enough. This harassment was part of a much broader pattern of discrimination that included entrapment and violence. At the time, sodomy laws weren't repealed in California until 1976, and this gave police a really shitty reason to harass the gay community in bars, restaurants, alleys, or wherever they could. And unfortunately, the general public followed a very similar sentiment towards the LGBTQ community. Gay men were targeted, mugged, beaten, harassed, and more. It wasn't enough that this was a reoccurring problem that was perpetuated by police, but now the community would have to worry about a serial killer as well. But amidst this chaos, there was a breath of fresh air in the police department, and that was Officer Rotea Guilford. And he was the first Black member of the homicide unit, and he went by Gil. Gill was a pioneer in fostering important relationships between the police and both the Black and LGBTQ communities in San Francisco. He and his partner, Earl Sanders, were practicing what we would call today community policing before it was cool. But even with Gill and Earl's efforts, the police department was a mess in the early 70s, especially concerning civil rights as well as the LGBTQ community. Gill and Sanders really strived to improve relations between the police and marginalized communities, but regardless of their efforts, the institutional homophobia within the police department hindered investigations and it allowed crimes against the LGBTQ communities to go unsolved, specifically this one. The Doodler murders are a prime example of this dynamic. The fear of being outed as gay prevented many witnesses and survivors from coming forward, and this really crippled the investigation. The lack of trust in the police meant that many in the community would choose over and over again silence over cooperation, which allowed the killer to continue his spray. The San Francisco Police Department's investigation into Gerald's murder faced numerous challenges right from the beginning. On January 28th, Gerald's body was getting processed by the coroner, and Gill and Sanders were assigned to that case, but their plates were already full. During that time, they were already working on the zebra murders, which was a huge case, though as of the 28th, there hadn't been a murder in that case in just over a month. 
On January 30th, Gerald's body was released, but the night prior, so the 29th leading into the 30th, the deadliest night of the zebra murders case unfolded. The second victim of the doodler would emerge a couple of months later. Jay Stevens was a triple threat. Not only could Jay dance and sing, but he did comedy and drag, and he did it well. Jay Stevens was born on January 20th, 1947 in Fort Worth, Texas, later becoming an on and off resident of San Francisco. According to Jay's sister, Melissa, she believes that Jay would identify as a trans woman today, but Jay referred to himself as he within the LGBTQ community, so I just want to be sensitive of that. Jay was 5'10", beautiful, and fashionable, so it isn't shocking to know that he was also a star. Jay was, again, a really talented drag performer who performed in a trio act with his sister and a male comedian, and they called themselves the Wonder Sisters, which I love. Now, at birth, Jay's given name was Joseph, although he dropped that and just referred to himself as Jay later on, but that is how police referred to him. After he performed at the Cabaret Club in North Beach on June 25th of 1974, the 27-year-old would later be found by a tree at Spreckles Lake in Golden Gate Park. Spreckles Lake, that area at Golden Gate Park, is also like Ocean Beach where Gerald was found. They're almost considered to be lovers' lanes for the gay community. Similarly to Gerald, except for that one small defensive wound on his pinky, Jay didn't have any defensive wounds on his hands, which implied that Jay likely wasn't facing the attacker when it began. Jay was stabbed in the back and chest and had punctures in both lungs. Like Gerald, Jay's blood alcohol content was very, very low. Unfortunately, after Jay's death, the tragedy did not end for his family. According to Kevin Fagan's investigation into this case, Jay had another sister, not the one he performed with, named Alma, who thought that Jay's murder caused the release of evil spirits. Three months after she lost her brother, she attacked her sister. She was the one who performed with Jay. And she attacked her with a sledgehammer to her head and ended up dismembering their mother before she burnt her in the family's fireplace. Thankfully, the sister survived the attack and she's, she's okay today. But Alma, the sister who did the attack, was institutionalized. The doodler's third victim would come even quicker than the second victim did following the first. Klaus Christman wanted the American dream. Klaus, who was a German immigrant born in 1943, came to the United States to build a better life for his family. Back home, Klaus had a wife and two daughters. The 31-year-old who worked at a Michelin factory once he came to the United States was working as a bar manager in Germany in a bar that was considered to be gay-friendly. So it wasn't a gay bar, but it was a bar that was open to whoever wanted to come in. In April of 1974, Klaus traveled to San Francisco to meet up with an American friend that he had met while he was serving in the United States Army, but he was stationed in Germany as well as that man's wife. After visiting, he decided to stay because he thought that it could be a really good opportunity to build a better life for his family back home. But just months later, on July 7th, Klaus's dream would come to an end. On the night of July 6th, 1974, Klaus was at Bojangles, which is a bar in the Tenderloin District. The next morning, around 6.30 in the morning, his body was found on Ocean Beach near where Gerald was found. Klaus had been stabbed 15 times and was unfortunately nearly decapitated. Detectives noted that that scene was one of the worst that they had ever been to. According to the coroner's report, there were no means of identification found on the deceased's person. Because Klaus was so new to the United States when he disappeared, nobody looked for him and they really had a hard time identifying him. The San Francisco Sentinel, which is a paper that serves the LGBTQ community, published a coroner's photo of him, which is a very dark photo. I'm not going to share it, but you can find it on Google if you want to. So they shared this photo of him in an article hoping that the public could help to identify him, which thankfully it did though the photo is really upsetting. 
12 days after Klaus's murder, Sergeant Elliot Blackstone of the San Francisco Police Department published a response to an inquiry regarding gay murder victims. Obviously, this is now the third person who could be tied to the LGBTQ community and the public wanted answers. In his response, he stated that he had reason to believe that Klaus had, quote, certain factors in his physical evidence that gave him reason to believe that he may have been gay. Klaus had been found with his pants unzipped, which was not consistent with Gerald or Jay, but Klaus's autopsy did not indicate sexual assault or any consensual activity. Klaus was wearing orange biker shorts underneath. He was also wearing several rings and had makeup in his pocket. These factors coupled with where he was known to frequent and the fact that he was identified after the Sentinel publication all led police to believe that he could be gay. Three men brutally murdered between January and July. All three men were believed to be gay and found in areas known as lover's lanes to the gay community. All men were brutally stabbed and yet police failed to make a connection or maybe they had made that connection and they just didn't care. Frederick Elmer Kappen was a decorated Vietnam War veteran found on May 12, 1975, almost a year after Klaus, in the same general location as Gerald and Klaus on Ocean Beach. At the time, Fred had been working as a registered nurse. Fred served as a Navy medical corpsman in the Vietnam War, and in 1965, he pulled four injured Marines out of a combat zone while taking fire which resulted in friendly fire hitting him in the leg and it shattered his leg. Fred was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal for Valor. Fred was also a talented artist. After his career in the Navy, Fred relocated to San Francisco. Fred's body was found in a sprawled position behind a sand dune. Fred's murder, like the others, bore the hallmark of extreme violence with multiple stab wounds. The majority of them were surrounding his heart. Fred was at Bojangles earlier that evening, which was the same place where Klaus was the night of his murder. Up to Fred's death, each case was being handled by a different homicide investigator, including Gil and Earl, who were working Gerald's murder. And thankfully, Fred's murder finally prompted investigators to work together and they all turned to Gil and Earl for guidance, which isn't surprising considering that they had a solve rate of around 90% as a team. While the killer took his ID, Fred was able to be identified thanks to his military records. He was buried in a plot in Bremerton, Washington, near his family. The fifth victim would come very shortly after Fred. Harold Goldberg, a Swedish-American immigrant born in 1908, was an avid traveler hitting many destinations around the world before he became a United States citizen in 1955, settling in San Francisco. Harold was born in Ekaby and left home at 16 after he forged papers that allowed him to ship out as a merchant sailor. There was little known about Harold until Kevin Fagan's investigation. Harold was discovered in Lincoln Park on June 4th of 1975, at least 10 days after his murder. Because he wasn't found until that long after, his body was in an advanced stage of decomposition. His case, however, was slightly inconsistent with the other homicides so far. He was older, he was 66, and this time his underwear had been taken by the killer. Harold was buried at Olivet Memorial Park in Colma. Harold's teeth, when he was found, were in a degraded state, which caused investigators to suspect that he may have not had a home at the time, but it was discovered that he did have a room at a local Mariner's boating house. So between Klaus's murder and Frederick's murder, there was about a year. There was less than a month between Fred and Harold's murder. Barely any time at all. The doodler would then amp it up even further with another attempted murder the following month. And while the year between Klaus and Fred may not be a cool down period for him, since it's suspected that there could be up to 16 victims, but what we know of the doodler's attacks in 1975, I look at the closeness and then the multiple attempted murders that I'm about to discuss, and it suggests that he's either becoming more erratic or maybe intentionally more brazen. 
One night in July of 1975, a man known as the Diplomat was approached at a late night diner called the Truck Stop. When the doodler decided to approach the Diplomat, he decided he was going to switch it up a little bit. And instead of drawing a picture of the Diplomat, he drew animals. The Diplomat was impressed and the pair left the diner and headed towards the Fox Plaza a few blocks away, which is where the Diplomat lived. While inside of his apartment, the doodler asked him if he had any cocaine, which is not something that we know happened before. He then went into his bathroom, where he didn't emerge from until about 30 minutes later with a completely different demeanor. Angry, he shouted at the diplomat, you people are all the same. And it was obvious that you people implied gay men and that anger was directed towards him for being gay. He told the diplomat that he had done this before and that he enjoys it. He brutally attacked the diplomat with a knife several times before the knife blade broke off during the attack. The diplomat threw his attacker into a wall and thankfully this made him run away like a little baby. Not even two weeks later though, the doodler went back to Fox Plaza to the same floor where the diplomat's apartment was. But this time he coerced another man, an actor, to let him in. And this time he tried a different approach, maybe because of his recently failed attempt, maybe for other reasons. But this time he decided to restrain his victim. There are some sources that hypothesize that this could have been done in foreplay. And then there are other sources that suggest that this was probably him trying to mitigate the issue he had during his previous attack, which failed. And obviously, because we don't know who the doodler is and nobody's ever asked him, there's no way of knowing, but sources jump between one of the two. Once the man was tied up, he began to yell at the victim, repeating a similar line to what he said to the diplomat, you guys are all alike. This prompted the anonymous actor to start to scream as loud as he could, which pissed off his neighbors, thankfully, and caused them to start banging on the surrounding walls. And then this made the doodler run. Very closely to the second failed attempt, there was a third. The doodler went after a high-profile figure that Gil and Earl referred to as a well-known household name. As the doodler and his victim were approaching his bed, a knife fell out of the doodler's jacket's pocket. As the doodler and his victim were approaching his bed, a knife fell out of his jacket pocket, and this prompted the man to run for his life. Three attacks at the Fox Plaza in a few weeks, two of which involved very high-profile individuals. The three survivors all filed police reports, but they would not agree to testify if the suspect was apprehended, because doing so would mean that they would be outed publicly, which meant that they were putting their jobs at risk, their relationships at risk, and their peace at risk. The identities of the three survivors remain sealed today, and while it wasn't ideal that they wouldn't go public, these three individuals were an integral part of the investigation. A composite sketch of the killer was created based on the survivors' matching descriptions. The composite sketch illustrated a young black male between the ages of 19 to 21, although some sources say between 19 to 23 years old. The young man had a slim face, was approximately six feet tall and was wearing a black knitted cap. He told the survivors that he was a commercial art student. Using the information from the survivors, Gill was able to create a profile of the serial killer, which he provided to the San Francisco Chronicle. One of the books I read for this case titled The San Francisco Doodler Murders quoted Gill in his statement to the San Francisco Chronicle. Gill stated, that he thought that the killer likely had a quiet, serious personality, probably with an upper middle class education and above average intelligence. He further stated, but he's having difficulty with his sexuality. He's probably ashamed of what he's doing. The guilt he is experiencing causes him to want to erase the acts that he's committed. The composite sketch was finally released to the public during a press conference in October. And the doodler's face was one that was certainly recognized by the public. And that is where I am going to end it for part one. You have survived another episode of Fuck That. If today's episode didn't make you lose your faith in humanity, I will try again next week. If you liked what you heard today, please like, subscribe, 
You can find me on all social medias, F that pod, except for Instagram, which is F that underscore pod, Patreon, F that pod, and the website is F that pod.com. 